Hello, I'm Mark Payne. Welcome to History Alive. History Alive is a program of the West Virginia Humanities Council that brings historical figures to life through portrayals by presenters who have conducted thorough research into their character. These presentations are both entertaining and educational. The Humanities Council makes these characters available to nonprofit organizations across West Virginia, such as schools, libraries, historical societies, and a wide range of civic groups. Their presentation fee is paid by the Council, and we ask only that their travel costs be covered by the host group. History Live is designed as an interactive experience between the character and the audience. We encourage your organization or school to host a presentation and bring a figure from history for a visit with your audience or students. Having someone like Pearl Buck or Chief Logan come to speak to your group can breathe life into these historical figures and make them more real. Nothing compares to the live, in-person visit. Each presentation consists of three parts. A monologue, a question-answer session with the character, and then the presenter breaks character to answer questions about how he or she conducted their research. The presenters on our History Live roster have researched a variety of sources such as diaries, journals, letters, official documents, autobiographies, and the research of other scholars in developing their character. A History, present, a History Alive presentation is not a play. It's very much an audience participation event that relies on interaction between the audience and the character. Being able to ask your own questions of these important figures from the past is a unique experience. It's difficult to reproduce the feel of an actual History Live presentation here in the studio. Without an audience to ask questions, we will change the format a bit and have our guests sit with me for a few questions after the monologue. But we hope to give a sample of how a History Live presentation can add to the offerings at your school or organization. There will be information on the screen at the end of this, of this program for how to contact the Humanities Council about bringing a History Live character to your community. At this time, I would like to welcome today's guest from history. We are pleased to have with us in the studio today, labor activist, Mother Jones. I've been called a humanitarian in my life, but let's get one thing straight. I'm not a humanitarian, I'm a hellraiser. I have been all over this nation trying to create decent working conditions for people throughout this country. I started traveling the country when I was a very young girl. As a newly immigrant from Ireland, I wanted to see more of this country. And so I took a job teaching in Memphis, Tennessee. I hadn't been there very long before I met a young man by the name of George Jones. George was an iron molder. In fact, he worked for the union, trying to create decent working conditions for the men in those factories. And I fell in love with him, and I married him. I soon had four children. But in 1867, yellow fever swept through Memphis, Tennessee. My husband and all four of my children died. No one came to see me, no one was permitted, for I was under quarantine. For three months I sat by myself, listening to the death carts in the street, praying that I would die too. And when my quarantine was lifted, I went to nurse the hospital. It was then that I saw that it was all power people in that hospital. We didn't know it then. We didn't know it was the squalid tenement houses we lived in. The factories that were terrible that we worked in that caused the yellow fever to run rampant through my people, the working people of Memphis. When the yellow fever had run its course, I left Memphis never to return. But I had to make my way. There was no widow's benefits in those days. I went to Chicago, Illinois, and I opened a seamstress shop. I would go to the homes of the wealthy people, and I would see their opulent mansions, their fine crystal chandeliers, their dogs that ate better than the children on my street. And I would go home to my house to see the working people of Chicago. But that was destined to change as well, for I'm sure that you all know that in 1871 there was a great fire in Chicago, Illinois. My home, my shop, everything I owned except the clothes upon my back were lost in that fire. Once again, I was homeless. I lived in the basement of a church in a refugee center for a while. And it was at that time that I heard about an organization called the Knights of Labor. And I went to their meeting. 
I was most intrigued with this new union. Oh, there had been many unions before. There had been plumbers' unions and carpenters' unions and iron molders' unions, such as my husband belonged to, and coal miners' unions. Well, there were two for the coal miners, one for the Irish and one for everyone else. But never before had there been a union that brought all workers together. More than that, the Knights of Labor insisted that unskilled workers had the opportunity of a union, the first union to do that. They addressed the needs of blacks, recently freed from the Civil War. Where would they fit into the workforce of America? And women, leaving farms to work in textile factories across the South. How would they become part of America's workforce? I was most impressed with the Knights of Labor. And I became an organizer for them, working on a voluntary basis, going to union meetings and, and speaking for them. But in 18 and 90, the Knights of Labor decided that they would be more powerful if they merged with another union. And in 18 and 90, the Knights of Labor became the United Mine Workers of America. And I became a paid union organizer for the UMW of A. It wasn't until 1900 that I first came to West Virginia. I came and just watched for a while and surveyed the situation. At that time, men were working 18 hours a day. They didn't get their coal weighed. They dug a ton of coal with an aching back. They had to dig a long ton, a ton and a quarter, for the company said men put too much rock in their coal, and they had to dig a ton and a quarter for every ton they got paid for. A mule was worth more than a man, for if a mule died, he, a new one had to be bought, but a man simply died, another one would be hired. And men didn't get paid in cash. They were paid in company money. It was only good for the company star. Oh, my friends, I know things have changed today. I know today you get paid in cash. I know you get a check weighman to make sure you get credit for the coal you weighed. But that wasn't brought around in an easy manner. That wasn't brought around by talking on a convention hall floor. It was war, war in the West Virginia hills. When I first came to West Virginia, I was told how backward and peculiar these mountain folk would be. I was told that these ignorant hillbillies would take a wooden nickel for a day's pay. But when I arrived, you were on the verge of stop and work yourselves. You were not ignorant, huddled masses, but proud men beckoning me to swear you in to the United Mine Workers of America. Nowhere did I find men or women more involved in the harsh realities of life than in these West Virginia hills. And I promise each and every one of you, when I get to heaven and I meet my maker, I am going to tell God about medieval West Virginia and the conditions you are forced to live in. It is you who keep me fed and sheltered and hidden. <laughs> For my presence here made the coal barons uh, uncomfortable. Oh, and I take great pleasure in that fact. Why, I have been arrested on more times than I can tell ye. The first time I was ever arrested was in Fairmont, West Virginia. I was talking to some union boys, even though I was told as an organizer there was an injunction keeping me from talking to the union boys. But I did anyway, for what else do you talk to a boy about but coal mining? And then I was arrested. I begged, be put in jail with my boys. But they said there were no facilities for women. And I was taken to Parkersburg and put before Judge Jonathan Jackson. <laughs> Judge Jackson would not put me in jail. He called me the most dangerous woman in America. A pride I wear with title, with pride. I said, that I would like to see Judge Jonathan Jackson again. And he said that he would not put me in jail because I would be a martyr for the Union cause. My friends, I have been arrested on so many occasions. The longest I was ever arrested and held in jail was in Pratt, West Virginia. Something about having a cannon. Oh, I denied having that cannon. But I was put in jail 
and I was held there at a house in Pratt, West Virginia, and I would write long letters to the Charleston papers saying what a horrible thing it was for an old woman like myself to be kept in jail, and I'd roll those up and put them in a Coca-Cola bottle and drop them down the gutter, and then I'd go out and walk down the road and have a bite to eat in Montgomery before I got back that night to be in jail again in the morning. John Mitchell, the president of the United Mine Workers, said I was more dangerous in jail than I was out of jail. For when the word went out that a poor, old, defenseless woman like myself was in jail, soon the hue and cry would go out to set me free and I'd get back to work getting back in jail again. <laughs> now, I wasn't always arrested. One time, I wanted to talk to the boys on Cabin Creek, but there was an injunction keeping all union organizers from talking to them, from even walking on company property. They owned even the roads in those days, you know. Well, it was February, and my colleagues said there was no way we could get to the boys in the holler, but I was not going to give up. I hitched my skirts to my knees. I was 72 years old at the time, and I walked up the river. I stood on a rock outside of Kayford for 45 minutes and gave an organizing lecture and turned around and went back the way I came. I never got arrested, for I'd never stepped foot on company property. Another time I went to see a young boy, one of our boys, in the Kanawha County Jail. I asked him why he was there. Mother, he said, I've stolen a pair of shoes. I told him it was a pity. If he had stolen a railroad, they would have made him a senator. Tis true, the rich get rich, and how do they do it? They do it because you work for them. I've seen their houses. I've seen their wives' fur coats and their opulent mansions. I've seen your house and the things your wife has to wear and your children and how hard they work. And I know this now. The government of this nation is not in Washington. It is in Wall Street. So fight like hell in Congress. I needn't tell you boys, or most of you, I suppose, I long ago quit praying and took to swearing. Well, when I pray, I'll have to wait till I'm dead to get anything. But when I swear, I get things done here. So go ahead, pray for the dead, but fight like hell for the living. My friends, I have not entered the Union cause today. I have seen it rise and fall. It is the solidarity of labor that we need. The corporate powers have joined together. We must do the same thing. We must join together as men and women, of blacks and whites, of workers, of coal mines, of factories, of railroads. Wherever workers work, we must unite as one. The history of the union movement has been that of blood. It's been that of hunger, and today, today we are reaching our final crisis. And when this crisis is over, humanity must be free. There must be no robber class and no working class. Every American benefits from the blood and the bravery of the union movement. I hear about things where I am, 40 hour a week, unemployment compensation, vacation days, these things were not given to you by the corporate powers. They were fought for and won by union workers throughout this nation, and it is your heritage, as much as the American Revolution is your heritage. Now, my boys, you're mine. We've hungered together. We have fought together. And we have marched together. But I see victory in the heavens for you. I see God's hand guiding you and inspiring you. No white flag. We cannot raise it. We must not raise it. We must redeem the world. We must get together and stay together. And when the enemies of your union lie moldering in the grave and the world will have forgotten that they ever lived, your work and your union must live. You are the heroes of today, and your work must be the legends of tomorrow. I'm back with union organizer and labor activist, Mother Jones. Mother Jones, I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your schedule to be with thank us today. Thank you, young man. Uh, I'd like to start by asking you, uh, 
where is your where is your home where is my home was well, after I lost my home in the Chicago fire I never again had a home my address is like my shoes it travels with me most people think that I had a home in West Virginia for a while I did stay here on and off for many many years with many good friends but never had a permanent home here yeah, so you never actually lived in West Virginia Not full time okay um, when you were in West Virginia uh, well as far as that goes uh, around the country how did you usually travel well, in those days, there was several ways to get around. If I was going long distances, of course, by railroad was the way to go. And we'd go by horse and buggy. I suppose occasionally we might get into an automobile, but very few of the people that I knew had automobiles. For the most part, I walked. I would walk everywhere I'd want to go. If I found that there was going to be a reception waiting for me at the train station, put me back on the train and send me out of town, I might get off a, a station early and walk that 20 miles in over the mountain to the town I was going to. thought nothing of it. <laughs> well, I, I certainly would have thought something of it, but uh, I guess that's the difference between you and me. Um, you, uh, you mentioned earlier that you first came to West Virginia in 1900. I'd just like to ask you, uh, what was it that brought you to West Virginia? Well, of course, what brought me to West Virginia was working for the UMWA. I was always already working for them by that time. And um, we needed to get into West Virginia, for it was the last state to be unionized. In those days, what we talked about what as union organizers was shorter hours and higher wages. And it worked in every other state but West Virginia. In West Virginia, it didn't matter uh, how high your wages were. The company store would just raise the money, raise the prices. Mm -hmm. So we had to first do away with company store before we talked about higher wages. And in West Virginia, you were your own boss. You, you, you ran a crew, you, you bolted the roof, you did the things on your own. And um, what, what was important to the West Virginia workers was doing away with the mine guard system. So as union organizers, initially, we were talking about the wrong thing. And we learned that we had to organize West Virginia. When every other state in the union would go on strike, West Virginia would keep working and would uh, threaten to, uh, to ruin the strike. So we had to get into West Virginia. It was mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you came, when you traveled on... Uh on official UMWA business. Did you travel by yourself? Not often. There was usually a, a cadre of us, uh, three or four or five of us that would come together. Come in a team. Yes. So. yes. Um, how were women involved? Or were they involved? In well, the well, they most certainly <laughs> were. For um, in many ways, you know, there were women like myself who were organizing. Uh, mother Blizzard, uh, Big Bill Blizzard's uh, mother there in Cabin Creek. She mm -hmm. was very involved. Uh, um, Aunt Molly Jackson in Kentucky. There were women all over who were very involved in the union movement. But and I always said you can never win a strike if you didn't have the women. For two reasons. First of all, if a woman didn't approve of the strike, a man had a hard time going to strike against his woman's wishes. But more than that, women knew how to wait. In a coal camp, women would wait for news of their husband every day. So a woman could wait out a strike much better than a man could. So a woman was crucial to, to get in a strike one. Many a time, I would gather up an army of women. I would arm them with nothing more than pots and pans and brooms. For I didn't want to be peered too confrontational. <laughs> and I'd march them over the mountain. For example, from Cavefort, we marched over the mountain to Whitesville one day. And we met the scabs who were going to work that day. We didn't have a gun on us. We didn't have a rifle. But we had pots, and we had pans, and we had brooms, and we were prepared to use them. And that morning, we met those scabs. Not a one went to work that day. Uh, I'm curious, did you support the uh, suffrage movement? The women's suffrage movement? I get that question a lot, young man. I did not. I think you should raise hell rather than raise the right to vote, first of all. I did go to some of their meetings. And those meetings were all won, run by fancy society ladies with their great big hats and their long fancy dresses. Now I can tell you something. God made women and Rockefeller made ladies and I want no part of those ladies. So I didn't get involved in the women's suffrage movement. Um, what would you, th what do you consider your greatest achievement so far? There was a strike in Wisconsin that I think as, of as my greatest victory. It was working with the girls in the breweries there. See, those girls had to, to wash the beer bottles. From the moment they got to work, they were drenched wet to the bone. Walking home in Wisconsin weather, they would often get chillblains by the time they're 18 years old and not be able to make their living anymore or have to make it on the street. They were dead of consumption by the age of 21. All they asked for was a place to change clothes. But those greedy owners wouldn't give them a corner of the brewery until I organized all the United Mine Workers of America not to drink one more bottle of Milwaukee brewed beer until those girls got a contract. They were, the brewery owners were so frightened of losing one sale of one lousy bottle of beer, they gave the girls a contract before we ever called the strike. 
by working together, brewery girls and coal miners, we changed the world. Mm -hmm. I am most proud of that. Uh, well, on the flip side of that, uh, I'd have to ask you, what would you, what do you consider your, your most uh, bitter defeat in your efforts? I would have to say my most bitter defeat came here in West Virginia, the land I called home on and off for so long. It come to be known as the Battle of Blair Mountain. Perhaps you've heard of it. I have. The Battle of Blair Mountain was a terrible event. I, I heard about the miners amassing in Marmette, where I was in Mexico, living in Mexico City at the time, and I came to them. At first, I exhorted them to raise their guns, to march toward Logan County, fight Sheriff Don Chafin, and, and free the union organizers he was holding illegally. And then I began to hear about the firepower being brought to bear against our boys, the West Virginia Guard, the National Guard, the militia. I knew there was no way we could fight this fight. I begged them not to march. They didn't believe me. They didn't listen to me. They marched toward Logan, and the rest is history. At this time, I would like to introduce uh, the presenter of Mother Jones, who is in reality, Karen Varanch. Karen, thank you for being with thank us. Thank you today. so much for having me, Mark. Um, it's a pleasure being here today. Well, Karen is is uh, one of our. Uh, most in-demand History Live presenters and has been for uh, quite a few years. I've been on the roster since 1989, right, since its inception. And you do also Pearl Buck. I do Pearl Buck for you as well. And you also, I know you present a lot of characters. I have seven of characters. Talk with, uh, History Live style characters. Right. Seven Not all of together. which are on our roster, but Correct. I know you travel the country and do, and do several do. of these. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to ask you, <clears throat> excuse me, first what uh, I ask all of uh, my guests on this show, which is, what was it about Mother Jones that moved you and compelled you to want to do the research necessary to Well, to of course, her? coal history is my passion and, and what I really focused on in my graduate degree. I studied under um, uh, Fred Barkey, who many people in West mm -hmm. Virginia know, and um, consider that to be a privilege. And uh, my first uh, work that I did was a play called Coal Camp Memories about life in the coal fields of West Virginia. So, and people know me from that as well. Actually, in uh, 1989, when Pittston, when the UMWA was on strike against Pittston, some, uh, the union came to me knowing I had done Coal Camp Memories and asked if I would consider uh, putting together a short Mother Jones presentation. And um, mm -hmm. so that's where I started with Mother Jones. I, I went up and down Cabin Creek with a couple of banjo players and fiddle players and doing Mother Jones shows. I actually went to Wise, Virginia and was the warm-up speaker for Cesar Chavez, which All was right. very exciting. Mm -hmm. And then about that time after I had uh, developed um, some, done just a very initial research, nothing really extensive, then the History of Life presentation, the um, roster was created and the Humanities Council put the call for characters out. And I thought, this is perfect. This is just what I'm looking for. And um, so I began the research at that point then to, to, to make it a, a full-fledged yeah. History of Life character. Uh, and speaking of the research, which you know th that end mm -hmm. of uh, that that part of being uh, a history live presenter can be daunting for some people. I mean, it, I don't think everyone realizes uh, the, the the depth in which folks need to to do research. And there's two there's two daunting aspects. One is when you have a character like Mary Draper Ingalls, who I do, when there when she was illiterate and had nothing, very little written about her at the time, um, and and you have to piece together information from the period as well as what you can find for her. And then you have a character on the other end of the spectrum like Pearl Buck for me who, who wrote hundreds of books and hundreds of articles and hundreds of nonfiction books and hundreds of lots was written about her. So you have these two um, problems in both, both respects. Pearl Buck took me about 18 months to put together. To do the research on, wow. um, and I'm not, and I'm not never stopping. I still I haven't gotten through all her novels. I'm still working on those novels. Um, Mother Jones, there's a lot written about her as well. Uh, she did some. She wrote an autobiography. It was actually ghost written and written when she was quite old and, and um, considered to be a little inflammatory. Probably not entirely true, mm -hmm. um, but that there is certainly some really wonderful biographies um, about about her and some work about her. Not in the least, um, uh, Ed Steele, the uh, retired professor from WVU, uh, edited a book of letters of hers and speeches of hers, and then wrote a book called The Court Martial of Mother Jones. And those three books are really valuable books. Hmm. Uh, about when were those written, if you remember? Well, Ed Steele probably wrote them in the 70s, I'd say. He wrote okay. them fairly recently. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just out of curiosity, do you, is it your experience uh, in, in trying to find mat uh, material to, uh, to, to research for Mother Jones or about Mother Jones, 
Was there was she always sort of in the news, or did she sort of take a dip in history and was neglected or you forgotten know, and rediscovered? I would say she was what? definitely neglected for a while. I mean, first of all, it wasn't common to cover women, and secondly, you know, she was just really an outrageous character. I wouldn't say the union necessarily got along with her well in the early days. Uh, she was um, a loose cannon. She never was the uh, an. Uh, top of the membership of the echelon she you know you, she never knew what she'd say she would you know call a judge a scab or an organizer a scab so she was frontline foot soldier you know kind of person plus she um, the other problem with that is that uh, she really did not get along with John L. Lewis and actually the reason why she took a step back from the un union was because of John L. Lewis is becoming president and I think it's twofold first of all I think they're a lot alike. They both need to be center stage, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, but the second thing is, is that Mother Jones felt that once a factory or a coal mine was unionized, then you, as the organizer, went took your place back on the line. There was no place for hierarchy. John L. Lewis realized that there would always need to be this this um, layer between workers and management uh, negotiating for workers, that there was actually a, a permanent job there in mm -hmm. union organizing. And Mother Jones didn't agree with that. And so that was a real fundamental difference that would happened uh. about the 1920s. Mm. And so she, she really believed that that to, to, to have a union organizer with a salary, a full-time salary doing just union organizing w was not appropriate. But, but of course, I think time has proven that that was the change that needed to happen. Mm. But at the time, she did not get along with John Anna Lewis. In fact, she requested to be buried in a cemetery outside of St. Louis, uh, Mount Olive, where the, uh, ma the martyrs from the Reardon Massacre were buried. They were Catholics who the Catholic Church wouldn't allow to be buried in their cemetery. So they created a, a bur uh, cemetery for them. But it was an NMU cemetery, which means National Miners Union, the union that was the adversary or the competition to the mm -hmm. UMWA. So by asking to be buried at Mount Olive, she was slapping John L. Lewis in the sort face even after death. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you think her, did she have any uh, special feelings about or toward West Virginia? I think, think she absolutely did. Uh, she did a lot of work in West Virginia, West Virginia and Colorado. And um, she certainly was here more than she was anyplace else. For, for many, many years. She, st she spent a lot of time here. About and what period of time was I mean, if she first came in Well, she came in 1900, and, you know, by, well, Lewis becomes president in 1920. So, um, so she, she is, and then she does a little bit more work. By 1917, she's doing a little more work. She's actually not even working with the union as much by 1912 really officially. Um, she's, do, she does some work in Pennsylvania area and she still works around this area, but she, I guess I mentioned uh, she was living in Mexico City when mm -hmm. she was getting older. The, um, she done a lot of work for to help the Mexican independence against the Portofino Diaz, the, ah. the um, autocratic ruler there. And um, the Mex and she'd also, so, you know, the, the UMWA in the East was very successful with overcoming racism and getting uh, people of color and, uh, and immigrants and people who were already living in West Virginia to work together. Whereas in the West, they were not successful. The Mexicans and the um, and uh, not as much African Americans out there, but um, the Mexicans and even the Greeks and the Italians were considered to be a different group of people. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a lot of racism out east, out west. And uh, she was able to overcome a lot of those. The, the racism were really, really fought hard for Mexican workers. So the Mexicans wanted to give her a place to live for the rest of her life. But she was um, the altitude bothered her, so okay. she came back to. In, in the last uh, ten seconds here. Uh, when when did she pass away? She died in 1930. She always wanted to live to be 100 years old, and she said she was born in 1830. But in actuality, she was born in prob probably in 1836. Lois McLean uh, did that research. But still, I think her, she she was a remarkable woman who made such a con contribution to okay. labor history. Thanks, Karen Varanch, again for being on Thank History you. Live.